Well, welcome tonight to Frock On, Indigenous Australian Textiles and Fashion. And it's my real pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Louise Hamby, who I've known for many, many years. I don't even know how many years we go back, but uh, I count her as uh, a dear friend, uh, someone who also loves Labrador Retrievers, um, someone who loves Indigenous <laughs> Australian art, and um, and particularly the fiber arts. And um, mm -hmm. she has what I would have said on many occasions is probably the world's best collection of contemporary fiber arts. Um, and she has been so kind as to share that collection with UVA too. So um, some of you might uh, recall an event that we did in 2016 called Culture Couture, Culture Couture um, that was organized by Lauren Maupin. And it was a fashion show showcasing Indigenous Australian fashion. Um, at that point, the fashion field was really growing and it has flourished since then. So there's a lot to talk about tonight. And, and Louise um, is someone who has kept a very close eye on this area of um, Indigenous art and ornament um, and fashion. She's an anthropologist. Um, she most recently held a fellowship at the National Library of Australia. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of her past projects. She was chief investigator on uh, Australia Research Council linkage grant called 50 Years of Collecting the Mill and Gimby Mission, um, and is currently a visiting research fellow in the School of Archaeology and Anthropology at Australian National University. And since 20, 2003, she's been an honorary associate of Museums Victoria. But her research topics are vast, and they include Indigenous fiber arts, material culture of Arnhem Land, Indigenous collection-based research, and digital repatriation, um, and re-documentation of museum collections, which is a really uh, growing field. And she also works extensively with archival material. I don't know if she's going to even talk about some of her film industry work tonight, but <laughs> she's got her finger in just about every pie that you can imagine. Um, some of her past projects include, and we have some of her books in the back here, um, or books that she's contributed to, but Art on a String, Twine Together, uh, Women with Clever Hands, and then she's contributed to um, this book, Aust Aboriginal Screen Printed Textiles from Australia, that was recently at the Fowler Museum at UCLA. Um, and I don't know anybody who uh, matches her clothing, fingernails, and accoutrement <laughs> in such a beautiful way, a beautiful and colorful way as Louise. And every time I see her, she's a beast for the eyes. Uh, please help me welcome her. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Maya. I'll have to take the mask off. <laughs> Thank you. As a person with many allegiances, I would first like to acknowledge the uh, Monacan people of this area, my own Appalachian family from North Carolina, and my adopted Yolnu family from Northeastern Arnhem Land. In preparing this talk, I thought it was relevant to the topic and my own interests to know that one of my degrees was in fabric printing from the University of Georgia. In 1978, I had no vision of the role fabric printing would be in my future working with Aboriginal people in Australia. Hot, exciting topics like fashion in the Australian context with domestic and international appeal have been slowly developing and are often collaborative. There is room for discussion around what fashion can mean from everyday wear to haute couture or something else. The Australian Indigenous movement started small with humble beginnings owing much to the development of fabric printing. Printing is a well-known te technique and is widely practiced by non-Indigenous artists but for the First Nations people of Australia, it is a recent addition to their classic art practices, such as string, basket making, mainly belonging to women. 
This presentation will provide some of the history of the practice and recent successes, particularly in the fashion arena, like you saw in the film before us, with a focus on remote communities. As with many ventures into projects, into communities, there is always the question of how this will benefit the artist and their communities. So I turn my discussion to fabric itself. Fabric, or cloth, was first introduced in Arnhem Land by Macassan traders three to 400 years ago. They came to collect beche de mer, or tree pang, and traded a range of goods for the services of Aboriginal people, and this included fabric. Cloth and sarongs were amongst these trade goods. Early documentation of the presence of cloth comes from rock art images of figures, possibly wearing sarongs of patterned fabric. Later, images of bark paintings reflect the presence of the sarong and its Makassan heritage. When missionaries started to come to Arnhem Land and other places in Australia in the 1920s and 30s, clothing and cloth became very important. On the mission, people were required to wear clothes. It was often the missionary wives who were given the responsibility of quote, clothing the people. Ella Shepherdson that you see in the center of the slide was at Mellingimby, was also involved in the trade of cloth as well as sewing. In a letter to her mother, Mrs. Payam, I quote, it's quite a nice thing. I will send this letter airmail because I know you'll be longing to hear from us. Also, I would like if you possibly could get me some bright red or any bright color cotton crepe for trading purposes. Three dozen yards if you can get it and put it in our Christmas box. So in this photo, they are opening these Christmas boxes which come from relatives and friends in the South. Cloth was also used during mission times to make Christmas bags that were given to everyone at the mission on Christmas Day. So leave to your imagination what would happen to these cloth bags after Christmas. The cloth given or traded to people was not just used for clothes, but it was used in other ways, such as the making of flags. Fragments were used in the construction of baskets and other wearable objects. This slide shows a basket collected from Baldwin Spencer that contains strips of fabric from 1912. Moving up a bit in time, in 1999, Shirley Milinjara was producing baskets like this one. It is not dissimilar to the one collected by Spencer, but contains broader and brighter strips of fabric. By mission times, Macassans no longer came to Arnhem Land, but the admiration of the patterned, colorful Indonesian sarong continued. Starting with them, fabric also had the potential to become an economic com commodity within the mission and their own communities. Nicholas Peterson, an Australian anthropologist, was working at Miranacha in the 1960s. Cloth was a very valuable commodity. He noted that people hoarded cloth as a form of wealth in long rolls of 8 to 15 yards. Henry Harper, project coordinator at the Arnhem Land Progress Association, remembered that Alpa purchased a lot of cloth in particular genuine batik in the 1970s. This is a quote from Henry. It sold very quickly. The old guys squirreled it away. And what they used to do was that they had little suitcases that they would put in the ceiling of their houses. That batik, I saw that material regularly when I would go to ceremonies or as a gift, or you would see it on show for more than 20 years later. People knew the value of it and they could tell it was original batik as against machine printed. 
cut, this type of cloth was used as gifts during ceremonies and also in a variety of ways. In this 1951 photo from Axel Poignant, you will see the cloth bolts in the center of the image. If we look at cloth during mission times, you will see that it's used in making different articles of clothing. People were creative in their use of newly acquired fabric. From the 1930s, Shepherdson's photo, you could see that the batik sarong fabric was highly favoured. It is seen in the common article worn by men, the naga. The style has subtle differences, but in early times just could be a piece of fabric hung over a string belt. This creativity extended to fabric that did not come on bolts, but in the form of everyday packing materials like sacks for flour. In this 1948 photo by the American anthropologist Frank Zetzler, Melangimbi, the staple food item of, a, of flour bags has been repurposed into a naga held by a Western leather belt. This combination of old and new is something to note for future fashion trends from First Nations people. I want to show you just a few changes in the naga. This image I took at Garma in 2003, and it was the first time that I saw printed fabric, indigenous printed fabric used for a naga with the addition of this elaborate bark belt. In 2019 at Ternanthi in Adelaide, the Tiwi dancers were wearing their own printed fabric with artists like Timothy Cook's design, which you see here. Most recently, like now, <laughs> at the Marayan exhibition at the Hood Museum, I spoke with Ishmael Marika about his video projections in which the dancer Dancer Karajmahara wore matching naga and headband in his four projections. We discussed the color symbolism that he used. Um, within the exhibition, there were an equal amount of Dua clans and Yuracha clans. So he used two clans from each moiety in his projections. So the white was worn for Japo the blue for Madapa, the green for Datiwai, and the red for Dawangu. So it's interesting that this naga continues but to carry different meanings. Not to be left out, the women and girls also made use of the fabric that was traded or given to them. This Shepherdson photo from the 1930s shows two young girls wearing patterned fabric skirts combined with a classic matka or breast harness. Here is a sarong skirt worn at the opening of the Tiwi exhibition in Darwin in August this year. And you will note they are wearing one of their own fabrics. This is Freddie <coughs> Portomari's design. Um, they wore it in white and I bought it in red for my collection. These skirts that you saw at the beginning are worn every day by women in Arnhem Land, and many of these are produced in Indonesia and sold in Darwin. The history of fabric printing in Arnhem Land is closely linked to what is happening in the fashion world and the economic potential of this industry. Tiwi Design and Inuluka Art and Crafts were founded basically as screen printing facilities. These and many other art centers were known primarily for their world-renowned art in the form of painting and sculpture, not particularly for their position in the design and commercial world with printed fabrics. This is now changing for many art centers. Early on, a main objective for Aboriginal art centers was to provide a means of making money for the artist. As Anthony Wallace, <laughs> project officer for the Australia Council in 1973, explained, well, at that time, 
the NT administration considered places like Tiwi Design to be job creation opportunities, not creative opportunities. Even before art centers were formally established, adult educators and communities played a key role in the development of fabric printing, and in some cases became the reason an art center was established. Now, there is a lot of emphasis on creative opportunities like the world of fashion. Diana Wood Conroy was appointed as the first manager of Tiwi Design in 1974. During her time at the Art Center, printing on fabric was the primary focus of art production, continuing with the tradition that had started earlier of printing small animal motifs on placement things like placemats. Another major printing art center with a similar history was Inuluk Arts. In 1983, Wendy Kennedy took on the role as adult educator and was given the challenge of finding employment for young people. Screen printing was that activity. This photo is from 1992 in the print area in your luck. In a similar fashion, Maripan Arts had its start in 1986. Eileen Farley established Magellan House. One of the main objectives of this was women doing stencil printing on fabric. It was the humble start for the now high-flying printing coming from Maripan today. But these are the original founders from the late 1980s. Basically, screen printing has not been thought of as a part of the art world, although the imagery is easily placed in that category. The end product can be repeated indefinitely, as we see in these two fabrics being printed from Inuluk Arts and Crafts. It is highly technical in its processes and often involves many people. It is important to remember that fabric printing is tied to an economic base. To make screen printing viable, the artists need training in the processes necessary some understanding of the nature of fabric printing is necessary in order to position it within some sort of economic perspective. As master screen printer Tim Grocott says, textiles are a different type of industry, a different world. The collaborative nature of screen printing in Arnhem Land and other remote communities provides the opportunity to bring together not only Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal textile artists, but provides a means for different Aboriginal people to work with each other. Maya Haviland uses this term co-creativity to describe the facilitated nature of collaborative practices between different cultural groups. I will briefly describe the processes, but first an introduction is needed to the master screen printers who have been employed to facilitate this process. The Tiwi Islands have been home to early screen printing, as I mentioned before. Diana Wood Conroy was at Tiwi Designs on Bathurst Island. James Bennett was at Jillamara on Melville Island. Ray Young, now deceased, was also at Tiwi Designs and then moved to Inuluk Arts and Crafts in Gumbalanya. More recently, <coughs> these printers have included Tim Grocott, who's worked at Inuluk, Jillamara, and Maripin. Jude White has worked at Inuluk, and most recently, like two weeks ago, was at Icon G in Haas Bluff on a new range of fabrics. Bobby Rubin has been at Babara in Maningrida and at Maripin. In order to produce a fabric that's screen printed, there are many stages in the process. The master printers that I've shown you each have their own style and method of working with artists at all stages of production. By default, they do influence the final design on the fabric. An existing artwork can be selected for modification 
or a new one can be designed. In this image, new drawings are being done at a workshop <coughs> held by Jude White at ICONG. At other times, animals, plants, or objects are the source of the original drawings, as in this fishnet design being done by Priscilla Badari at Inulaka Arts and Crafts. And then once there's a design, it has to be put into repeat. Adjusting the design and put it in repeat can be very complicated. Now most art centers are making this easier by making the repeat the full width of the fabric so that one screen is the repeat. The adjustments only need to be made from top to bottom. In this image of Jude White's workshop at Inulak, Sylvia Badari and Katra Nanjamiri are finishing the designing of a print which they call Kunja Babarki or Dilly Bags. And that's the finished length of fabric. So much has happened between the time of the first screen printing for table mats and calendars. Mind you, this is the most beautiful calendar I think I've seen uh, at Tiwi Design to the runway fashions using printed fabric. Some, Ab some Aboriginal people have been making their own garments in these communities. Beamaware on Bathurst Island has been operating since 1989 and make clothing for people in their own community and for their own use. This is the local Tiwi women's choir and they all wear Bema clothes for their performances. A few Aboriginal designers like Bronwyn Bancroft, a Bundjalung woman, ran designer, Ab <laughs> designer Aboriginals in Roselle, Sydney from 1985 to 1990. In 87, she showed her work with four other Koori designers at Old Printemps department store in Paris. Her work is featured in the recent Bumali book from Klugi Roo, which I think is at the front. What was more common earlier on was not Indigenous designers, but non-Indigenous designers using fabric from Indigenous artists. And this is the case in the 1980s, Ace Burke invited people like Linda Jackson and Jenny Key to make garments from Aboriginal printed fabrics. Now, leading up to the major success stories of runway shows like Country de Culture and Darwin, there have been many events and individual people who have promoted the use of Indigenous printed fabric. And I'll just give you a few of these moments. Traveling with Yarns was a forum and a workshop from the 22nd to the 25th of August in 2012. And this was an exciting event hosted primarily on the remote printed textile, focused on the remote printed textile industry initiated by master printer Tim Grocott. This forum was convened by myself and brought together indigenous artists and experts in textiles, fashion, art, and technology. And it was particularly important because it was held on country, not in some capital city or university. I hope there's some people in the audience who follow horse racing, uh, because if you do, you may know something about the Australian Melbourne Cup. Associated with this is a very prestigious Fashions on the Field event. A fabric design by one of Maripin artists, Marita Sambono, was used in a dress design and made by raw cloth and worn by model Chloe Mu, who won the prize in 2013. Raw cloth is a business in Darwin that makes unique garments from hand-printed fabrics. Their specialty items have been made from fabrics printed by Indigenous artists. And this news about Chloe Chu uh, winning the prize wearing Maripin, this made national headlines as a fashion model was wearing an Indigenous design. 
not to be outdone. <laughs> Soon there were others who were wearing garments made from Indigenous printed fabric. Senator, Senator Nova Purvis, Natasha Griggs, Federal Minister for Solomon, wore Aboriginal printed fabrics for the opening of Parliament. Griggs also hoped to establish an international reputation for these fabrics. So during the 2014 Royal Tour of Australia by the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, now the Prince and Princess of Wales, Griggs presented them with a, a wonderful selection of Meripan fabrics. I wonder what they did with them. Ufala Upala was the title of the National Indigenous Textile Forum held in Cairns in 2013. It focused on printed and painted textiles and fashion, bringing artists, facilitators and industry representatives together to define the future of the Australian Indigenous textiles sector. And it also included a fashion show. Riding on a wave of interest in Indigenous textiles and fashion, Maripan Arts Festival 2014 launched Old Stories and New Ways, a cultural performance featuring their contemporary textiles that created a stir across Australia. The fashion show used local models and received assistance from Grace Lillian Lee, Indigenous fashion designer, and Bobby Rubin, who collaborated on some of the fabrics and I must remind you, this was held at Maripan, not in some capital city. Meanwhile, on the remote Darnley Island in the north e northeast of the Torres Strait, the new label, Alan Passan, or Island Fashion, was emerging. The Arab Meta Arts community had discussed the need for a label that was appropriate for Islander lifestyle and could also sell nationally and internationally to mainstream customers. They had a seven year history of printing fabric and t shirts, making skirts, and learning new skills through workshops. They wanted to reinterpret the traditional loose and flowing Islander dress to make it suitable for locals as well as for other customers. A collaboration with Grace Lillian Lee enabled the production of a capsule range, which was shown in Sydney and Cairns. Lynette Griffiths, consultant with Arab, concluded, Alain Passan feels comfortable moving forward with Indigenous design, created with meaning for those interested in wearing art, story, and sharing culture across borders to share their ideas and unique island culture from the world. To do this, they are happy to work with others in a respectful, collaborative fashion. In the inaugural Australian Indigenous Fashion Week, which took place in April 2014 at the Sydney Town Hall, associated with this forum were creative lab sessions with a design collaboration with fashion designers and fabric producers. And Alain Passan was one of these groups. Also, we had Desert Designs with Jimmy Pike Designs. And Babara was represented from Managrita with a designer, Carissa Singstock. A star at the event was the Yorta Yorta model, Samantha Harris, wearing items by Grace Lillian Lee. And so amazing uh, pieces. <coughs> also, the master printers and facilitators, Jude White and Tim Grocott, were at this event. Now, I can't help but put in a chart. This one. Uh, I've prepared a chronological chart of the runway shows. Kluge Roo was actually a forerunner for the famous country de culture in Darwin. But 2014, if, before this chart, was a year that inspired many, including Lauren Maupin from Kluge Roo. That year, she visited me in Australia and many others. And it was the start of the planning for 
culture culture. This event, as Margot has mentioned, was a collaboration between students at UVA, Marcy Linton of the Drama Department, Department and Indigenous Australian artists and designers. Fabrics from major producers included Babara, Arab, Inuluk and Meripin. So it's nice, nice to think about it, something happening here first. But 2016, if we just go back to the chat, you will see from 2016 onward, there's been country to culture every year. But 2016 was the first show held in Darwin, sponsored by the Darwin Aboriginal Art Fair. And this was spearheaded by Claire Summers and Grace Lillian Lee. And they acknowledged that many events, like the ones I've already talked about, paved the way to doing this show in Darwin. Francesca Cubello, the chairperson of the Darwin Aboriginal Art Foundation, expressed what the runway fashion events can be. This is Francesca's words. I believe that the catwalk is a contemporary equivalent form of a ceremonial ground or site, and both are seen as performative spaces for honoring the ancestors and the artist country. What's unique, uh, this is a quote from Magnolia Mamaru from Model also from your color. She says, what's unique about indigenous fashion is that it is so connected to land and culture and it has a meaning to it from that person to the dress to the earth. When you wear it, you feel connected. So for me, I wear that dress with pride and I walk and I make that dress talk. Now, I now want to talk to you about a different approach to the fashion runway uh, with garments made from indigenous printed or dyed fabric. The events Get It On and Frock On originated from Felicity Wright, the current owner and operator of Songlines in Darwin. And I think what she has to say is, really kind of sums up this different approach that I want to talk about. Encouraging creative people to take risk and cut into screen printed Aboriginal textiles was the impetus behind the inaugural Get It On exhibition held at Aboriginal bush traders in Darwin in 2017. There was a reluctance for many who bought these textiles to actually do anything with them by the combination of their cost and the reduction of the integrity of the work. A way was found to encourage sales and boost the pride of the Indigenous artists. They gave fabric to designers and makers, encouraged them to be creative, displayed the results with the full attribution of each person involved in the process and the display of the work. And instead of being paid for their work, the makers got credit for more Inulot fabric. I was fortunate enough to attend this inaugural event. The chairwoman at Inulot Arts and Crafts at that time, Donna Najamarek, opened this event with 40 of the designers who actually wore their garments to the event. And if you know, some people might know some of these people. There's Gabriel Marlin Gora standing next to Donna Natumeri at the Get It On in Darwin. This event was repeated in 2018 with a much higher profile. The Honorable Claire Martin, Chief Minister for the NT, opened this event. There was a red carpet runway and garments were shown afterwards at Aboriginal Bush Traders. I finish this section with a quote from Flick Wright. The get it on model was a departure from the old culture paradigm where clothing designers are rarely the ones actually making the garments. Get it on gave credit to the ingenuity of both designers and sewers 
who imagined and constructed the clothes. The strength of it lay in collaborations. Frock on now. Um, I, I'll just, you know, I'll move on to frock on. Uh, but before that, um, the lady that you see on the right, this is Joanna Barkman. And we came to a, um, a this event before we went to Inuluk in preparing for the exhibition at the Fowler Museum. So um, I think this is quite typical of what happens, COVID delay. Um, unfortunately, I didn't actually get to see the exhibition because it was open much later and I still couldn't leave Australia. Now, I'll just let's go on here. Frock on started with these artists. Flickwright had embarked on a partnership with IKG artists at Haas Bluff. And they produced a range of items like bags, purses, and they were made in Cambodia. This art center was well known for its famous paintings before starting a textile reputation with bold patterning. Many of the designs on fabric are inspired from their painting and those of their ancestors, like the ones in the current exhibition at Klugi Roo of Papanya Artist. It was only in 2017 that screen printing began in earnest at the center with a workshop led by Tim Grocock. And these are some of the items that um, they made by Better World Arts, is one of the companies in Cambodia. Those are from all designs from Haas Bluff. Frakon had its origins in the Get It On series. The fabric used for the makers came from Iconji now, and they use much the same approach. People received fabric, they made garments, they gave them to Iconji, and then they were given fabric credit. A major difference was the social media impact. The call out was made on various social media platforms like Instagram and Facebook. The results were made by 27 different makers featuring Iconji fabrics, of course. And a film was made similar to the one that I've shown you earlier. Many of the garments have since been used on runways and worn by various celebrities. This is a dress made by Anna Reynolds from a lot of different Iconji fabrics. Katura Zimmerman's Pulley Pulley has been a very popular fabric. Lots of people like to wear it, particularly when it's printed in, on silk with gold. <laughs> Indriana Tunka made this dress going for gold and she used the fabric of Alice Nampenjimba Dixon and it's the uh, rock holes fabric. It too has become very popular. This is the same dress uh, worn by politician Linda Burney. This dress gets around. Uh, Celeste Barber wore it at the preview of the Elvis movie. So you are beginning to see um, part of the success of Frakon and the Iconji things has to do with they make the people to create these garments and then they loan them out for politicians, stars to wear and they gain lots of publicity. The success of Frock on 2021 made doing the second one easier and it was equally as popular. Frock on 2022 was successful featuring more than 25 garments and accessories ranging from casual wire wear to bridal garments. And the call out for Frock on 2022 is go for gold <laughs> again. 
Much of the fabric at Eichinger Arts is now being printed at Publisher Textiles in Sydney. And this is Micheli Naparula's design that you see here. I had first-hand experience this year being one of the 22 makers for the event. We used over 70 meters of Ikonji fabric making the garments you've seen in the video. We've been nicknamed the Frockistas. I selected Watajuta, designed by Micheli, because of my interest in material culture. The Watajuta are acacia trees, and they are the ones that are used to make ceremonial spears. I wanted to continue this interest in material culture, but from an aesthetic view, I wanted to contrast this black and white print with bright colors and stitching. So all of the garments were displayed at Songlines in Darwin after the film was made. Now, in conclusion, just a little summary here about the fact that fabric in bright colors and patterns have been a part of the material culture of Arnhem Land since Bacassan times. By the time of colonization, more fabric became available and larger pieces were used. The introduction of fabric printing came about not particularly because Aboriginal people had asked to learn this technique, but it was seen by the government as a means for income generation. Now printed fabrics are a means of different people working together at different stages to produce uniquely designed pieces and is providing an income stream for a large range of Aboriginal people with different skills. And I show you this, this was about mm, maybe three weeks ago. And in here you have the Akaji designs being worn by models in Paris with two of the artists. So Pulley Pulley and the pink design is worn by the person who actually designed the fabric. That's Couture Zimran. And this is, and the other one is by Rosarana Larry. So they've been traveling to London Week, Fashion Week in Paris and to the Venice Biennale. So they are really hitting the world stage. And I leave it at that. And if there are any questions, we might have some light or whatever. And yeah. <laughs> just some of the um, things from the film. I don't have a question, but I wanted to show off one of the wonderful garments. <laughs> 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 you didn't talk much about menswear. Is, is there any direction for menswear? Uh, yes, in the. Um, I didn't talk about menswear specifically because in the fashion shows there are men wearing the clothes and women wearing the clothes. So, and I guess not so much talking about men because it depends on the community. But in some communities, it's both men and women designing fabric, not necessarily men and women designing garments, but both men and women design fabrics. I don't know if that clarifies your question. Are there as many garments made for men as women, or is it, it seems more? What was the question? Sorry, is, are there as many garments being designed for men, or is it more focused on women? Oh, I think you could see from just the images I've shown you, most yeah. of them are for women. <laughs> but having said that, um, there's been, from, particularly this year's Country de Culture, uh, there have been a number of male models that were extremely popular. And uh, <laughs> two of them were for Gapa Weak, actually. So um, what is happening because of this 
if you like, this fashion boom, is we are now starting to see uh, particularly younger people, but not just younger people, in the community actually wanting to model the clothes, particularly the guys. Maybe we'll see more menswear soon. Mm. Louise, can you talk a little bit about the ornaments, the ornamentation? And, um, Particularly in frock-on. Okay, yes. In frock-on, um, in the film, all of the, uh, well, the women pretty much, were wearing these amazing earrings, for example. And this was another sort of collaboration. They were made from G fabrics, but then they were hand stitched. You probably you know you could see the beautiful stitching on them, and then they were coordinated with the various um, garments that were worn. So that's one kind of thing. But um, I mean, I I don't really have time to go into a lot of detail about individual communities because there are lots of people doing this. But for the Gapawiak country to culture. The accessories, if you would like, were really a fashion show. Everyone was ooing and eyeing and, you know, they were elaborate hats, you know, like this wide made from pandanus, all sorts of things, uh, which really set Gapawiak apart from some of the other communities who were more dependent on the print of the fabric. Their show was about the objects that people wore, not the fabric. How did you, how did you become so interested in this? I mean, what, what direction did you take? That you okay. Um, well, at the beginning, I mentioned that my first textile interest was actually fabric printing. And that was a long time ago. But um, since living in Australia, I've been watching, you know, what are people doing with fabric printing? And is this just going to be something that gets introduced into a community? It's done once and then they forget about it and no one ever wants to do it again. Uh, because that model, unfortunately, happens with a lot of so-called new skills or new projects. But in the case of fabric printing, it seems to have established itself quite well, um, particularly starting early on, like with the Tiwi designs and then Inilak. And some of those places have had periods where they weren't producing as much. And then like now, lots of people are producing. So I was just following my own personal interest because I collect mainly three-dimensional fiber objects, but a personal interest has always been in the printed fabrics and the accessories. I have lots <laughs> of necklaces. <laughs> yeah. But Louise, I wonder if you could sketch that history a little more because I wonder, you know, I wonder whether there's been kind of a pulse to this because when I was growing up in Australia in the 80s and 90s, there seemed to be a fair visibility of and that was from people like Jenny Key, Linda Jackson, because um, in, in a way, if we jump way back to like the 40s or whatever it, within Australia, there were artists like Margaret Preston who advocated for the use of Indigenous designs on more domestic things like fabrics and tea towels or whatever. So there have been different times in Australia's history where there's been an emphasis, if you'd like, on maybe a more domestic side. But with Margaret Preston and those people, they weren't engaging with Aboriginal artists. They were just, you know, like being inspired by them to make those kinds of designs. So it's not really until we get, you know, like this old Franton in Paris, we start to see indigenous artist doing printing or doing um, fashion garments. So there's been a bit of a, a difference. And I guess what I'd really like to point out about the entire kind of 
not just the fashion, but all the fabrics that go into it, we really need to think about these as collaborative, creative outputs. And that's really important. And I think what's happened with like Frock On and Get It On, there's been this push to actually acknowledge all the people involved. How many of you go to movies and actually watch the credits at the end? People like Baz Luhrmann are very particular. They give credit to every single person who has an input into that film the horse handler or the child minder or whatever because the film doesn't work unless you've got all of them coming together and that's what makes the sort of fashion fabric uh, industry in Australia really different from say those fabulous bark paintings yeah, because that's sort of where I was pushing at because, yes. because the history that you mapped sort of maps along with market trends in Let's just say painting, yeah. but not exactly. And I was wondering if you'd given some thought to where those two things sit together. Between the painting and the fabric? Well, you might just say the high art market. A high art market. Uh, well, um, it's, a, it's a big topic, but I guess when I started my PhD, I did not really want to look at, if you would like, the art market. I wanted to look at works made particularly, they didn't have to be by just women, but it turned out to be mainly women, uh, that were made out of fiber, like pandanus or string, that people thought of as just utilitarian. But of course, the upshot of that for people who've been interested uh, there's a lot more going on than here's a basket and we can carry it and put something in it because of all of their links to ancestral stories, to country, to land. And the objects were very much tied to the culture, to the painting. And what you'll find, like I was kind of pleased to see this Papunya shower <laughs> because if you go in to... Clicky Woo, and you look at those Papadia paintings, and then you look at the book back there, the paintings from Hospital. A lot of those people are from the Papadia area, their brothers, fathers who were painters, and you can see some of the same imagery in those paintings. It's on the fabric, it's another way of telling the story. So I think it's a way of, of, of elevating, it not only elevates the fabric, but it just adds more meaning to the original story from whence it came. Well, I, I'm thinking of a pivotal moment where you're talking about 1986, the Neiman Marcus did an Australian sports house, and they did bring in Linda Jackson, yeah. Jenny and, and, Linda Jenny Linda and the art and the commerce in Dallas, Texas, there was lots of money, there was lots of interest. And, and that might have been yeah, that was one of those those moments. Fabrics came in, but the other thing that came in was that there was a lot of indigenous art that came. In. They took the couture salon and made it into a gallery. Many, many people in Dallas who had never been exposed to indigenous art before bought. Um, another factor that sort of you know crosses over the discussion a bit is the fact that um, previously, you know, there's been a, a bit of a downcline in Aboriginal art at the top end due to the economy, which is, you know, bouncing and changing back. But at that time, what people were discovering <laughs> was that they could still afford to buy some things that were not high-end paintings. You could afford to buy fabric or you could afford to buy a basket which might cost you $200 instead of 20000 for the painting. It could be the artist in the same family as that artist that you're paying $20,000 for the painting. So there's an interesting correlation which I, I try to keep mentioning this word money because in reality 
money is really important. This is how people make a living in their communities. It doesn't detract from the fact that it's art or that it goes to a gallery because someone has to get paid somewhere along the way. So um, I think that some people think if something's done for money that it's not authentic. But that's, I think we need to really move away from that because uh, having an income also allows people a lot of freedom to produce new things, to experiment because they have a somewhat of an income coming from their artwork. Yes, I was born not very far from here in North Carolina in the Blue Ridge Mountains, so I come from a family of making. Uh, sorry, Mark. Um, do you take it back to your uh, oh. relatives there? Oh, I bring them here <laughs> to Clinky <Clinkie> Room. <laughs> oh, yeah, I mean my family. Oh, yeah, my, my family, yes. But um, I guess one rationale for bringing objects from Australia to America uh, is, you know, A, I'm an American, but B, I want to try and educate people in America about Aboriginal art and Aboriginal people. And one way of doing that is actually to have objects here in America that people can actually go and see. So that's important for me. But at the same time, I'm also giving objects back to community from whence they came those that have some place to keep them. You know, I've been doing it for, I'm getting old, uh, you know, more than a quarter of a century. So artists have died and there's nothing of their work left in the community. So if I have something, then I'm giving it back to them to keep. Louise, I just want to also um, say that one way that that Louise has learned about fiber arts is by making, you know, learning how to make them with artists. And um, we had the real pleasure of being able to learn a little bit about how to make some objects from artists that accompanied her on a trip here a couple of years ago. Um, so I, I think there's something really wonderful about working with the materials, and even if they're even if they're printed material materials and not you're you're not actually twining the pandanus into something, you know, because you get right into it, you you get right into to the making aspect of it. Um, did you make the garment that you're wearing? Of course you did. Yes, <laughs> yes, I did. Complete with his face now. This this particular well the main the printed piece this is from Manning Greta and um, this is a oh, okay can't say anyway um, this is actually a lino print not a screen print uh, any printed fabrics I'm interested in and I actually think the lino prints are sometimes overlooked but they actually give artists a lot more freedom. And it's a lot easier for them to have control because they can do the whole thing, so to speak. So, you know, I've been at Babara where there would be these really old ladies printing and maybe they print a bit and then they just wash their block and they go off and do something else. Maybe they come back the next day, maybe a week later, and they go back to what they're doing and it doesn't matter. When you're screen printing, then, you have to keep going. You have, if you want to change the screen, you have to wash the screen or you've ruined it. You know, that's why I kind of want to give you a little hint about the making, the processes, because uh, like Tim Groke uh, was saying, it's a different world. Printing textiles is not really easy process. Um, and it needs a lot of attention on all the different stages. Um, but um, lino block printing, I mean, once you understand that, you know, what you carve away is not going to print, 
<laughs> once you get that concept, lino printing gives people a lot of freedom. And now what's happening, which is interesting, sorry to get sidetracked with the lino printing, but lots of artists, particularly like at Man and Greta and at Andiliwaka Groot and now in some cases at Gapawea, but not the printing, they are dyeing the fabric or their clothes with the same dyes that they're using on their baskets and their mats and their string. So it's a really interesting thing. And this year at the Darwin Art Fair, there weren't many, but there were a few pieces where the artist, like in family groups maybe, family at the outstation dyes the fabric and then it comes back into the art centre and somebody else does the lino printing on top of it. So again, it's a collaborative, but this case, it's collaborative within the artists in the community, not like between me or Margot or someone else. So there's all kinds of collaborative efforts going on, but um, I think it's in, you know important to be able to use some of the fabric. Mind you, I have pieces that are not touched that sit in the drawers because for me I consider them part of you know a museum collection but at the same time you know if you can make another hundred and whatever a meter because that's what these fabrics cost now some from a hundred to a hundred and twenty or maybe hundred and thirty dollars a meter so you do think twice about doing anything with them other than putting them in the drawer <laughs> because they're expensive Along those lines, Louise, are, are museums collecting these gar the garments made or just the fabric or what? Uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, I have to tout a little bit about Gapawiak, where uh, I spent most of my time in Onam Lim. They were part of Country to Culture this year in Darwin, and their things were so different from all the others that the NGV in Melbourne are, I'm not quite sure on the details. They're either buying the whole thing or parts thereof. And then there's also quite a bit of ready to wear, like what I'm wearing. Yes. Kunji. Mm -hmm. um, and there's the garment in the back by the um, sanitizer. <laughs> That's uh, a um, magpie goose. Magpie goose with inulac. Um, so, yeah, there, there are ways to. Kind of follow the art centers, find out when they're coming out with a line of ready to wear and order it online. And remember that Australian sizes are much smaller than US sizes. So <laughs> I don't think I'll ever fit into that dress. But. So, as I answer, mostly not, but recently, yes. What was the first For, for museums, museums collecting, oh. mostly not, but recently. Mostly not. I mean, look, I've been hounding people. You know, I, I just gave up, you know. So now, you know, it's become quite popular. And I noticed Tina Baum there <laughs> at the, in Darwin, you know, looking at the fabrics, you know. So, you know, it's like, you should have bought them 10 years ago when I said you should be buying them, you know. <laughs> so uh, now I think there is more interest in acquiring them than before. You match so perfectly with shoes that you make those. <laughs> No, I didn't make the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> she has a fetish form, I can tell you. <laughs> so to the question on um, about Appalachian stuff, I've known Louise the longest of anybody here. And we went in undergrad school together. Yes. And um, she would come and show slides of what she was doing. And as my son started at like four watching her slides, Every time he'd come, he'd pick out the same people or the artist or watch them age and progress. She never stops teaching. And she, if she makes something, the artist's name is always on the album. Yes, it is. Raylene always Bonson, the, the title of the print, <laughs> and lots of other stitching. <laughs> well, let's, it's fun. Let's thank Louise for a really great Yeah, time. thank you. <laughs>